Real Life Church, I am so excited and honored to be here with you. I've looked forward to this for such a long time. I know you don't feel like you know me well, but I feel like I know you pretty well for several reasons. Number one, a Kim and Steve Tarleton, who used to be on staff here, have been on my staff now for the past five, I think five years, and they brag about you guys all the time and talk about it, so I feel like I know you from them. We've also had uh, Rusty has been out to preach, Mike Bro has been out to preach, and so again, I feel like I've had a taste of what you have here. And then also, Rusty and I are in a group, a pastor's group, we call it our 5K group, and there's about 18 of us in the group, and we meet uh, a couple times a year just to share ideas with one another. And in that group, as you might imagine, we get pretty close, and so I consider Rusty just a great friend. And I can tell you, Rusty is a, uh, he's the real deal, and I can tell you that he's a one percenter. You know what a one percenter is? When it comes to leadership, he's in the top one percent. I heard it said years ago that if you can find a pastor, if you can find a pastor that is a one percent leader, you've got gold. And I can tell you, not only is he a great pastor, but he's a great communicator, he's a great leader, he's just the real deal. And so I think you guys found gold. I, I think you ought to give him a little bit of love right now. <clears throat> well, let me pray, and we'll, we'll jump right into this. Father, I thank you and I praise you for your faithfulness. God, you are an amazing God, and what an incredible opportunity it is to be able to come together and just to worship you in spirit and in truth. And I pray now, God, that you would just challenge each and every one of us that as we talk about this topic of habits, I just pray, dear God, that you would just be all over this and that, Father, you would challenge each one of us in our journey and our spiritual walk with you. Thanks, God, for your presence here today. We love you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. So, guys, I grew up in a middle-class home with parents that absolutely loved me. And yet, I had a father with a whole lot of unresolved anger. I never quite knew when he was going to blow or what, what it might be that was going to set him off. It might be a teenager driving down our road too fast that upset him. Or it might be we were watching television at night and he's trying to sleep and we had it too loud. Whatever the case might be, whenever it happened, things got loud and the expletives began to fly. And these outbursts of anger created a lot of different emotions in me as a child. Everything from making me angry over his anger to fear to embarrassment to all the emotions that you might imagine. On one occasion, I think I was about 11 years old, and I was going somewhere with him and riding in the front seat, and something caught his attention, and he was looking off to the side and didn't notice the car had stopped in front of him, and he slammed and rear-ended the car in front of him. And his first response, his first reaction was to turn and swear and scream and yell at me. That was typical for my father. Something had obviously happened in my father's life long before he got in the car that day. I don't mean minutes before, hours before, I mean years before. Some injustice in his life that was totally unrelated to that fender bender, some hurt or offense that was never resolved. So it left him responding to every perceived injustice with anger. After a while, his anger became so much a part of his life, guys, that he didn't even notice the damage it was doing to the people that he loved the most. Now, fortunately for me, the story ends on a much happier note. In my teenage years, my dad discovered a relationship with Jesus Christ, and it changed his life. I mean, literally changed his life. He stepped across that line of faith, and from that time on, he went out of his way to make sure that I knew that he loved me and to make sure that I knew that he was proud of me. God became a priority in his life. Now, I'm not telling you that he never got angry again because like all of us, there were things that upset him. But I do believe that it, at that point in his life, it broke the habit of responding to every difficult thing with anger. Well, today we're talking about uh, creatures of habit. Habits from my new book that by the same title, Creatures of Habit. And I uh, I don't know about you, but what I was surprised by when I did the research for this book is to find that we greatly underestimate the power of habits in our life. Research has shown that over 40% of the things that you do every single day, think about this, over 40% of the things that you do every single day are done out of habit. Now, that's amazing, 40%. 
Now, what is a habit? A habit is a simple choice that we make. When it's repeated enough times, it becomes an unconscious pattern. I want you to remember that. When you repeat it enough times, it becomes an unconscious pattern. Or in other words, it just becomes second nature. We don't even give it a thought anymore. Those habits then become our identity. In other words, you and I become known by our habits. People know who we are. That's how they would describe us. For instance, if someone, if someone, if you and I were friends and somebody asked me about you, and let's say that you were an honest individual, but you tend to complain just a little bit. And then somebody asked me about you. I would say, well, you know, they are as honest as the day is long. But they do tend to complain just a bit. What have I just done? I've just described you by your habits, and that's what we do. We describe the people that we know or the people that we rub shoulders with, we describe them by the habits in their life. And that's why it's so important that we have or we establish good habits. Okay, so how do we know if it's a good habit or a bad habit? Well, that's a great question because our brain can't delineate between the two. Our brain doesn't know if it's a good habit or a bad habit, so we have to be the ones that make that call. We're the ones that have to make that decision. A good habit is any habit that reinforces your desire to be Christ-like. A good habit is any habit that reinforces your desire to be Christ-like. In other words, as a believer, as a follower of Christ, we need to take on the nature of Christ. We need to become like Jesus. We need to take on his identity. So we want to establish the habits in our life that make that happen. The Bible calls those spiritual disciplines. Spiritual disciplines are those habits that we create that help us to take on the identity of Christ. Those also become stepping stones in our life. In other words, those are the things that help us to grow into the measure of the stature of fullness of Christ. Bad habits, on the other hand, are just the opposite. Bad habits conflict with who Christ wants you to be. So a bad habit is any habit that's keeping you from taking on the identity of Christ. The Bible calls those spiritual strongholds. In other words, you, you've created this unconscious pattern that has a grip on your life, and it's keeping you from looking like Jesus. Now, those aren't stepping stones, but in fact, those become tombstones. Those literally are a death to the dream or to the identity that God wants us to have. Now, the Scripture has a whole lot to say about habits. I have to admit that when I started in this, I thought, well, you know, I, found, I can think of a couple places where the Bible talks about habits in our life, but I couldn't think of a lot. But then as I began to research, I realized that it wasn't always called habits, but it had the same type of definition. The, the, the scripture that really comes to mind is Romans chapter 12, verse 2, that says, do not conform to the patterns of this world. Do not conform to the patterns. What did I say a habit is? A habit is an unconscious pattern. So to conform to something is to take its image, to take its shape. And so Paul, when he writes to the church of Rome, he says, do not conform to the patterns, the unconscious patterns, the bad habits of this world. But instead, what should we do? We should be transformed. Or in other words, we should be changed. How? By the renewing of your mind. Well, what are we trying to do? A, a habit is a mindset. And so you're trying to renew your mind to replace this bad habit with a good habit. So when you read that passage, you see that's exactly what Paul was talking about here. Listen, before you were a believer, now think with me, before you were a Christian or before you were a believer, the, the Bible makes it clear that sin had a grip on your life. Sin had a hold on your life. But once you step across that line of faith and you invite Jesus Christ to come into your life, that hold is broken. That grip of sin in your life is broken. In fact, the way Scripture says it is you now have the power to say no to sin. So then people come back and they say, well, if that's true, Steve, if that's true, how come I still feel stuck? I've been a believer for five years and I'm still struggling with complaining. I'm still struggling with lust or anger or whatever it might be. Why is that? And that is because even though you now have the power to say no to sin, you have this habit in your life. You've created a habit, and you didn't create it overnight, and so you're not going to get rid of it overnight. So, friends, what I'm telling you is that you have to be intentional about this. If you feel stuck because you have some of these bad habits in your life, you've got to draw a line in the sand and say, okay, enough is enough. I want to do something about this. I want to break this particular bad habit. 
Now, I think this book will help you grow. Obviously, I feel that way. I'm a bit prejudiced, as you might imagine. But as I wrote the book, I came up with 12 habits. Now, what I actually did is I came up with a list of 30 bad habits. And as I looked at it, I thought, okay, how am I going to decide which ones I want to write about? And I went through and I said, I know what I'll do. I'll pick out the ones that I struggle with. And so the 12 that I pulled out are 12 bad habits that I've struggled with to one degree or another in my life. And so I felt like, okay, I've dealt with these. I know what I'm talking about. I know what it's like to have to own it. I know what it's like to have to deal with it, to take these steps to break this habit in my life. And so I feel like, um, I feel like this is more like a workbook that you can come back to this. Let's say your habit is anger and you deal with your anger and then maybe a year from now it starts to raise its ugly head again. You can go back to that chapter and look at it again. In fact, let me just say it this way, guys. If you, some of you might say, Steve, I'm just not a reader. I, I just don't read. Then can, can you do one thing? Will you just go through the 12 chapters and pick out the one that you struggle with the most and just read that chapter? Just read that chapter and commit that in 2022, I'm going to deal with this. And I'm going to keep reading that chapter and I'm going to keep working those steps until I break it. And I think you'll see and you'll be motivated the next year to take on another bad habit that might be in your life as well. So today we're going to talk about the habit of anger. But I think it's important to mention that anger is not always a bad thing. In fact, anger is a God-given emotion. Anger is a God-given emotion. It's when it becomes a habit or the way we automatically respond to things, that's when it becomes a problem. In other words, let's say that that you do something to me and it makes me angry and and I respond, I retaliate or I raise my voice or I, I show a temper and then tomorrow somebody else does something and I thought, well, that felt good and so I do it again. And the next day, I do it again. And before you know it, I've created an unconscious pattern that I'm just going to respond to things out of anger. I mean, ask yourself, don't you all know of somebody that you say, they're they're just an angry person. It just feels like everything makes them mad. Everything makes them angry. Well, that's what I'm talking about. You've just repeated it enough. It's become an unconscious pattern. Anger is designed to help us, listen, anger is designed to help us deal with any threat that might come into our life. But it becomes a problem when you lose control of your words or your actions. For instance, we all know that Jesus got angry. If you've read the New Testament, which most I'm sure, most of you have, I'm sure, you know that Jesus got angry when he chased the money changers out of the temple. You see, the merchants were turning religion into a money-scape, money-making scam, and it ticked him off. It angered him. And I think, guys, that's not the only example. There were other things that made Jesus angry. Any kind of injustice, I believe, angers God. I think it angers God to see an adult harm a child. And yet, guys, even though Jesus got angry, the Scripture makes it clear that he never sinned. Jesus never sinned. You see, the type of anger that Jesus demonstrated was more of a righteous indignation. He got angry at those that acted contrary to God's standard of right and wrong, to God's standard of fairness, justice, and goodness. This type of anger, think with me, this type of anger is directed more at the wrong that is done and not so much towards the person involved. In fact, it's this kind of anger that produced great movements such as MAD, Mothers Against Drunk Drivers, The anger over the loss of their children motivated them to do something about it by starting one of the largest victim advocate groups in America today. On the other hand, anger is an emotion that many of us experience when the things in our world are not going the way that we want them to go. Maybe, for instance, I don't know, it could be anything. Maybe you've been working towards a promotion, but that promotion goes to somebody else and that ticks you off. Or you tell your kids to clean, your, clean their room and they ignore you. That makes you so mad. As I said, if, if anger becomes your immediate response every time you don't like something, then you're establishing a habit. And that becomes a problem. And it has the potential, listen, it has the potential to hurt your health, to wreck your peace of mind, to destroy your relationships, and to even threaten your career. I cannot tell you In my childhood, I cannot tell you how many jobs my father lost over his anger. I mean, he had literally dozens of jobs, fired from most of them over anger issues. 
I once uh, heard psychologist and author Dr. Richard Dobbins, I in fact invited him to our church to speak, and he spoke to a men's group. And as he stood in front of those men, he said, listen, men have three issues that they struggle with. They struggle with anger issues, they struggle, struggle with sexual issues, and they lie about the first two. Anger has become an epidemic in America, and I don't think I have to say much to convince you of that. Turn on the news. Go outdoors. I mean, anger is out of control. Emotional health is over the top. People are so frustrated. The whole COVID thing has added to our emotional struggles. And so people are just on the verge of blowing up all the time. You see signs of our nation's irritability everywhere you go. The polarization of the political system, the everyday nastiness of the online world, the cancel culture, oh my gosh. Or worse yet, is the workplace or school shootings. Guys, it's gotten so bad, we're afraid to lock eyes with anyone in fear they might lose their cool and pull out a gun. And yet, most violence is not random. Most violence is not random. The American SPCC says there's over, hear me on this, it says there's over 4 million child abuse cases reported every single year. Reported is the word I want you to hear. There's over 4 million reported child abuse cases every year. Can you imagine then how many go unreported? How many children are abused that it never gets turned in? And many of, that, many of those are abused by parents that are out of control. Friends, listen to me. No one is born with anger issues. You, you don't see this little infant in a baby, a, a little infant baby in a, in a crib, and everybody like, well, that is one angry baby. <laughs> you're just not, you're not born with anger issues. It is learned behavior. It is learned behavior, which is why, listen to me, which is why if you are a parent, you need to control your anger in front of your kids. It's a big deal. Psychologists have called our generation the age of rage. It's become so common that it's created its own rage vocabulary. For instance, there's road rage, which is a term I know that not only you've heard, but I'm sure many of you have experienced, or maybe checkout rage, or phone rage, or we even see it in recreational activities such as golf rage. Several years ago, true story, several years ago, there were four of us, all of us pastors, and we were golfing. And we were having a great day. It was a beautiful day out, just great to be outdoors. And, and, but the one guy, the one pastor was not having a great day. He was playing terrible. It was making him angry. And so he wasn't talking or laughing with the rest of us. And finally, he had one really bad shot, and it went into the pond, and he lost it. And he took his club, and he threw it into the pond. Well, now that's awkward. And so um, he gets in the cart and drives off. So we're like, well, what do we do? So we're not laughing anymore. Everybody's gotten real quiet over the next two holes. And then finally, about two holes later, he gets in the golf cart and he said, I'll be back. And he goes back and he wades into that murky pond and he finds his golf club and comes back. Proverbs chapter 14, 29 says, people with understanding control their anger. A hot temper shows great foolishness. People with understanding control their anger. A hot temper shows great foolishness. Some of you might argue with me today that you can't control your anger. You're like, Steve, I get everything you're saying so far, but I'm just telling you, I can't control it. I have an anger issue, and I cannot control it, and I'm simply going to push back, and I'm going to say, while you might not be able to control your situation, and you might not be able to control the way it makes you feel, you certainly can control how you express your anger. It reminds me, uh, also uh, said to be a true story, I read this several years ago, but it reminds me of a, a passion play, an outdoor passion play. And this guy was playing the part of Jesus, and he was walking up uh, this field, and as he would walk carrying this cross, and all the audience, spe or spectators are all on the sides. And he's walking up, and there's this one guy that's heckling him. And I mean, he's just really rude. And, his, and not all the actors, he just kept walking, following the guy playing Jesus and heckling him, telling him how bad he was and he was doing a terrible job and all that. And, and the guy playing Jesus is just getting livid. And he stops at one point and he puts down the cross and he walks over to him and he hits him in the face. 
He walks back over, picks up his cross, and continues on. Well, as you can imagine, the director afterwards said, what are you doing? I can't have one of my actors assaulting the audience, especially the one playing Jesus. And he's like, I'm so sorry. I don't know what got into me. He just made me so mad. And he said, well, it can't ever happen again. It won't happen again. So it goes out day two, same scene, same guy. He's back, only this time he's worse before. He's angry now. And so he's really coming against him and making fun of him. And fun, same thing. Stops. He loses his temper. He puts it down. He goes and hits him in the nose. He comes back, picks up the cross, and on he goes. The director afterwards said, that's it. You're done. You're fired. He said, I can't have my Jesus striking people in the audience. And he said, I promise you, please give me one more chance. He said, um, if I lose this job, nobody will ever hire me again. I'll never be able to act in this town. I really need you to give me one more chance. And he said, listen, I'll give you one more chance, but if it, if it happens again, don't even come talk to me. Just get your stuff and leave. You are done. I don't want to talk to you anymore. It'll never happen again. So third day, he's walking up the hill, and there's this guy back, more, more, uh, more obnoxious than he'd ever been before. And this guy is, I mean, he's grinding his teeth. He's clenching his fist. He's trying to do everything he can to stop. And finally, he stops. And he turns to this guy, and he said, I'll meet you after the resurrection. <laughs> I'm just saying to you, friends, if we don't learn to control our anger, we will never be like Jesus. You know, some try to use anger to motivate people to action. Maybe you can relate to this. You yell at your kids to motivate their behavior. You yell at the sales clerk to motivate them to help you. You yell at your employees to motivate them to work harder. And you know what? It works, at least in the short term. You can scare people into doing almost anything, but in the long run, you're always going to lose. Guys, listen to me, because anger always alienates people. I mean, think about it. When people are angry and shouting at you, does it draw you closer to them or push you away? I mean, when, well, I don't care how close you are to them. It could be your spouse. It could be your parents. It could be your best friend. But when they're shouting and screaming at you, do you feel like giving them a hug? No, I don't think so. You, you, you just shut down. When someone is being that, uh, showing that kind of emotion or anger towards you, you just shut down. So parents, listen to me. If you are a parent and you are using anger to motivate your kids, you are actually pushing your kids away. You think you're teaching them something, you're not teaching them anything good. You're not teaching them anything good. You are pushing your kids away. Listen, when your kids are young, they think you are a superhero. They do. I mean, everyone else might think you're quirky and they might think you're a little bit odd, but not your kids. They think you're a hero. They think you can do no wrong. Their little spirits are wide open. But if you continue to show anger towards them, it will close their spirit. So what happens is this. Moms and dads, please listen to me on this because I'm telling you straight. And it's like, here's your kid's spirit and here's your spirit. And you're relating to your children. And when you show anger towards your kids, you see their little spirits just start to close. And you can continue and say, well, things are better the next day and we're okay. It doesn't open their spirits back up. The more you demonstrate anger towards your kids, you are going to close down their spirit. And you might live together under the same roof, and you may tell them how much you love them and how, how important they are in your life. But once you've closed your spirit, you've closed their spirit. And that's why it's imperative. Listen to me, moms and dads. That's why it's imperative that if you have an anger issue with your kids, you need to do something about it before it's too late. And it may already be past that point. And if it is past that point, I would encourage you to get help and to let your kids know that I'm getting help for my anger. I'm sorry the way that I've been with you, but I want you to know that I'm going to get it right. I'm going to make it right. I'm getting this, ha this habit broken in my life once and for all. Paul recognized the danger of that when he warned us in Ephesians 6. He says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Listen to me, friends. If you struggle with the habit of anger, you may feel like there's nothing you can do, but you have more control over your anger than you think you do. You can learn to express your emotions without losing control. So today, that's what I want to do. Today, I want to give you some steps that you can use to break this habit in your life. 
And that's what I've done in every chapter of the book. I've given you, I've explained the habit and how it's a problem, and then I've given you some uh, steps that you can take. But can I just say this before I jump into these steps? Listen to me. If it, listen, if it doesn't work, if you take these steps and you still can't get rid of this anger habit, please seek professional help. I'm as serious as I can be. Seek professional help from somebody that specializes in anger issues because if you don't, you're going to alienate everybody in your life that matters. You're going to come to the end of your life. Listen, you're going to come to the end of your life. And there may be people that are still there because of loyalty or commitment, but there's all their spirits are going to be closed to you. And that's not, those are not the kind of regrets you want to have. And so I think these steps will help you, but if they don't, please, please um, seek out professional help. We often try to excuse our behavior by blaming others for our anger. You know, somebody will ask you about your temper and you'll say, well, it's those kids of mine. It's their fault. They make me so mad. My coworkers, they make me so mad. If that lady would not have said that, I wouldn't have lost my temper. Listen, before you ever break this habit of anger, you have to take responsibility. You have to own it. And, you, and I start every chapter before I give you the steps. That's the first thing I talk about. You have to own it. I told you these are 12, 12 habits that I struggle with. And the reason that I was able to deal with them is because I acknowledged all 12 of them. You have to acknowledge it first. You have to own it. You have to recognize this is a problem for me. And since it's a problem, I'm going to take the necessary steps to deal with it in my life. So I'm going to give these to you very quickly. Uh, uh, the book goes into more detail than I am, but this will get you started here. Number one, identify the source of your anger. Identify the source of your anger. If you have a habit of losing control over every perceived injustice, then you need to figure out what's really behind your anger. What's the thing beneath the thing? Well, what's really the underlying cause of your anger, in other words? Because anger is rarely the primary problem. In other words, it's usually the result of a much deeper problem, such as pride or hurt or insecurity or embarrassment. But once I understand, guys, once I understand what's behind my anger, I'm more likely to resolve it. For example, physical or emotional pain can cause me anger. When I was in the, my decade of my 30s, I had unexplained joint and muscle pain. Went to several doctors, and uh, nobody could ever figure out quite what it was. Some were saying fibromyalgia, some were saying arthritis, and there was all kinds of diagnoses that were made. But whatever it was, I know it was debilitating. And I know that for about a 10-year period of my life, I struggled with pain. And because I struggled with that pain, I had a short fuse. Because I hurt all the time, I was impatient with people. And I would lose my cool or lose my temper much quicker than I normally had before. So it's the thing beneath the thing. It's what's the primary cause. It could be physical. It also could be emotional. Maybe somebody hurt your feelings. Maybe somebody broke your heart. These are all common causes of anger. I'm just saying, if you can identify the source of your anger, you're more likely to understand. Listen, you're more likely to understand how to deal with it. Number two, learn to calm down before you react. When you start to feel those emotions of anger rise up, just take a few minutes to step away. Take a few minutes to collect your thoughts. Self-talk can be so effective. Is it really worth, you know, it, talk to yourself. Is it really worth me getting this upset over? Will my anger really solve anything? Proverbs chapter 29 verse 11 says, Fools vent their anger, but the wise quietly hold it back. In other words, guys, think before you speak. Put your mind in gear before you put your mouth in motion. I heard it said before, I've never regretted silence, but I've often regretted what I spoke. In James chapter 1, verse 19, it says, you must be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. I don't know whether you stick verses, Bible verses up on your refrigerator, on your medicine cabinet, on your closet door, but if you do, this is a good one to put up. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Number three, get some exercise. I know that seems like a, doesn't seem very spiritual, does it? But it helps to take a walk. It helps to go to the gym. Whatever you need to do to reduce your anger or stress level. Experts say, listen, experts say that exercise helps to increase the release of endorphins in your body, which will help you reduce your level of stress. Number four, let go of my anger correctly. 
gosh, there's so much that can be said about this particular point, and I talk a whole lot more about it in the book, but there's a lot that can be said, but just decide you're not going to handle your anger in inappropriate ways. For instance, don't repress your anger. Don't repress it. We get the idea that, you know, if I get angry, all I got to do is I just got to shove it down. I just got to ignore it. I've just got to pretend that it's not there. Your anger, your anger will always find a way to be expressed. For instance, don't use sarcasm. Some of you think you're pretty witty with your sarcasm, but it's actually coming from repressed anger. Some of you try to manipulate to get your own way. Others of you have this vindictive spirit. I don't get mad, I just get even. Listen, whether you complain, blame, or criticize, people that are always negative are usually trying to repress their anger. But anger will always find a way of release. Anger is like electricity. When a person gets electrocuted, that electricity can't be shoved down. That electricity has to come out. And they say that if a person gets electrocuted, it'll come out their fingers, some comes out their knees, but it has to come out. Well, it's the same way with anger. You can't repress it. It'll find a way out one way or another. People that are always negative are usually trying to repress their anger, but anger will always find a way of release. By the way, did you know there's another word for repressed anger? The word is depression. Depression is frozen rage or repressed anger. And yet on the flip side, you can't just express it with violent or abusive reactions or verbal abuse. That was my dad. My dad's way was just to express it, just to explode, just to let everybody know he's upset. I can remember as a kid hearing him tell my mother when she'd try to call him out on it, and he would talk about, well, you know, I'm never going to have emotional problems because I express my anger. Other people need to express theirs. Boy, talk about deceiving yourself. Listen, when you do that, you leave burn marks on everyone that's in your path. One pastor said it this way. He said, we often act like a skunk. We spray our stinking temper on anyone that gets in our way. Number five, practice forgiveness. Jesus was unjustly beaten and mocked. You know that's true. They placed a crown of thorns on his head. They nailed his hands and his feet to a wooden cross. If anyone had a right to be angry, it was certainly Jesus. And yet, do you remember what he said? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. If you really want to get rid of your anger, guys, listen, you have to decide that you're going to forgive the person who's done you wrong. I've heard it said that holding on to unforgiveness is like drinking rat poison, hoping the rat will die. Colossians 3.13 says, Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Lewis Smedes once said, To forgive is to set a prisoner free, and discover the prisoner was you. And yet, guys, forgiveness is a process. While it might take time to let it go, you can forgive the one that's wronged you. In fact, without going too far into this, you have to understand that unforgiveness is a bad habit. In other words, you, it's an unconscious pattern. So I decide I'm not going to forgive you for what you did. Next day, I find I'm not going to forgive you either. And before I know it, I'm just not forgiving people until, until I'm just an unforgiving person. And so to break that habit, you break a bad habit with a good habit. So I want to break this bad habit of unforgiveness with a good habit of forgiveness. I have to be intentional. I have to make a decision that I, I haven't forgiven you in the past, but I choose to forgive you. And if tomorrow I'm mad at you again, I have to choose. I'm going to lay it down again. But I'm going to draw a line in the sand, and I choose to forgive you. You can forgive that person that's wronged you. Six. Give your anger an expiration date. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul said this, don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. Paul's basically saying, look, you got 24 hours. Within 24 hours, you need to resolve this. You, you, need to, you need to be done with this. Some of you are carrying anger towards someone. You've been carrying it for years. You've been angry at a relative. You've been angry at, a, at, at someone in your life for years. And you continue to carry that. Paul is very direct and he's very clear. We have an obligation, we have a responsibility to forgive that individual. Don't let a day pass without resolving your anger. When you allow angry emotions to accumulate over time, like a pressure cooker, they will eventually explode in some destructive and some inappropriate ways that are only going to hurt the people you love the most. And it's only going to leave you with all kinds of regrets. Number seven, rely on God's control. Guys, if you really believe that God has a plan for your life, 
you will experience contentment and peace. If you really believe that God is who we say that he is, you will experience contentment and peace. I've seen the illustration before, and I use it with our people all the time, and I've got a, uh, two white pillars, and I said, as long, one says goodness, one says control, and I say, as long as you stand between these two white pillars, you're going to experience peace, God's peace. As long as you believe that God is a good God that absolutely loves you and wants the best for you and that God is in control and he has my back, as long as I believe that, I'm content. It's when I step outside those two pillars. It's when all of a sudden I say, well, I know he's a good God. I know that he loves me, but I don't know if he's got my back or not. I don't know if he's in control or not. All of a sudden that peace goes down and fear and worry and anger begin to rise. Or I may be on this side of it and say, well, you know, I know that, I, 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 I know that God's in control. I know he's still on the throne, but I don't know if he loves me or not. Again, patience goes down, peace goes down, and anger and worry and fear rise. And so I have to choose that I'm going to stand between this because I totally believe that God loves me and I totally believe that God's in control so that I can, in fact, experience a peace. Maybe you didn't get, maybe you didn't, for instance, I could give you several examples, but maybe you didn't get the home you made a bid on and that just makes you so angry. But then you realize, you know what? I trust God and I know that God has a plan for my life. I may not fully understand it, what he's doing right now, but I trust him so there's no reason for me to get upset. Listen to me, friends. Anger is not something you can prevent. That's not what I'm telling you today. Anger is not something you can prevent, but as long as you keep it under control and don't allow it to become a habit in your life, you will live and experience more peace and healthier relationships. I'm going to ask you, if you will, to... Um, bow your heads with me. Every head bowed and every eye closed for just a minute. Do it on all of our campuses if you would do this. While your head is bowed, how many, just between you, me, and God, how many would raise a hand and say, Steve, anger's a problem for me. Just raise it up and then put it right back down. Anger's an issue for me. Yeah. And put it right back down. Here's what I want you to do. I want to pray for you. But I want everyone in this place, not just those that raise their hands, I want everybody, just cup your hands like you're holding a cup of water. Just cup your hands right in front of you. Everybody do this. Whether you have anger issues or not, just form a cup right in front of you. And I want you to imagine putting all of your angry emotions, all of your bitterness, I want you to imagine putting that in that cup right now, just laying it down in that cup. God, today we make a decision to once and for all break this habit of anger. We own it. We acknowledge that it's a problem in our life. And God, today, we're going to take the necessary steps to break this pattern in our life. But God, we can't do it without your help. We absolutely need your strength. So I ask you, God, that you would give each and every one of us the courage to act and the strength to break this stronghold once and for all in our life. And now what I want you to do, guys, is just turn your hands over and just dump that anger out. Just dump it in the ground. This is all just symbolic, but it's a statement that as of today, I'm drawing a line in the sand, God, and I'm going to do something about this habit of anger in my life. God, I thank you that you've given us the power to say no to, no to sin. And so, God, today we determine to take the necessary steps to break this habit once and for all. We love you and we praise you and we know, God, that you gave us the power to say no to sin. And so we stand on that in Jesus' name. Amen.